this year, more of you in 22. That's not a, it's not a slogan. It's something that when I was in my office, God just, he just birthed that desire in my heart for more of him. God, more of you in 22. I don't know about you, but sometimes you make these, uh, these commitments, you know, that you're going, to, you're going to turn over a new leaf in the new year. Well, listen, the greatest way to start this new year out it was with a heart's desire of having more of him. More of you in 22. Heather and Eno, um, I had asked that perhaps if we could have something that would resemble a key and, and because of the message that I'm preaching on, because I'm preaching on today a key to having more of you in 22. And on that, I, I just I thank Heather for doing that. They, they came out beautiful. Now listen, you know the greatest place you can put this? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right there. And uh, it, it's, it's magnetized. So a lot of people really um, don't have a full understanding of, of what fasting is and, and how it touches the heart of God on our behalf. And so I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 6. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, thank God for His Word. His Word is a, a, is, is a, a source that we need within our heart that we might draw close to Him. Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to read... From verse 1, and I want to just share that with you. I've entitled this message, A Key to Having More of You in 22. Hold that up. Hold those up. A Key of Having More of You in 22. Hallelujah. The Bible is so implicit here in the, the sixth chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men. To be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore when you do a charitable deed. Do not sound a trumpet. Before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. This is Jesus speaking. That they may have glory from men. Assuredly I say unto you. They have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That your charitable deeds may be done in secret, that your Father which sees will Himself reward you openly. Verse 5. And when, please, don't, don't miss that. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and, and, and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you that they have their reward. But you, when you pray... Go into a room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, in that secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, and when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of even before you ask Him. And then it goes on to this manner, how we pray the Lord's Prayer. I want you to skip down to verse 16 and verse 17. Moreover, when you fast. Don't miss that. When you pray, when you fast. Do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint, Jesus speaking here, anoint your head and wash your face. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that I would not come with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Father, I know it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. I also know that it's the anointing of the Spirit of God that breaks the yoke. It's the anointing that tears down the stronghold of the enemy. It's the anointing and the power of God placed upon our being that can cause us to be whole and well. It can cause all the fears that, are, that have their attachments through viruses or whatever it might be that would try to attach themselves. Perfect love casts out all fear. 
And so, Father, I pray today that, that, Lord, somehow I would preach to an audience of one, Lord, to you, and that you would be pleased, and that your word would not be compromised, and that truth would be taught today in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There are many keys, but today I want to share a key that has transformed my life for the last 25 to 30 years. It's actually transformed me. It's transformed my, my marriage. It's transformed Gail and I. It's transformed the call that God placed upon our life. We were in a, in a, in a small town in central uh, Maine and and, and uh, we had just completed a time of an extended time of fasting and prayer. And we've called at the beginning of the year the church to fasting and prayer. We don't, les we don't legislate that. We are not a cult. That's between you and the Lord. But I want us to pay particular uh, notation to this. The Bible says when you pray, Jesus is saying that, and when you fast. I, don't miss that. It's not if, but it's, it's, it's when. When? And it was then that, that God called us to this beautiful Pioneer Valley 17 years ago and, and told us that, that it was going to be a, a place of hills and valleys, but He was going to move in a, an incredible way. And I thank God for the churches that preach the gospel in this community and this surrounding area. So by no means are we the only church because a, a, a church that says they're the only church, that's pretty cultish. But we're a part of the body of Christ. And there are many keys, but today I want to deal with a, an important one that's revolutionized my life. Jesus says something very important concerning prayer and fasting. Again, I want to reiterate it. He says, when you pray and when you fast. Well, well that's not for me. Well, well then don't, don't get my permission to cut that out of the Word of God. That, that, is not, that is not some reverend speaking. That is not some apostle. That's not some rabbi speaking. That's Jesus the Son of the living God. And he says, when you pray and when you fast, and, and, I, and I'm afraid in the body of Christ, Christians have never understood the full measure of the power of fasting, coupled with prayer. I think because sometimes we behind the pulpit have, have not taught this in the Word of God. But beloved, I cannot pick and choose what I want from God's Word. I want to stand on the authenticity of the inerrancy of the Word of the living God. And this is very much a part of God's Word. I believe that, that, that fasting will break the strongholds of the enemy. I believe that, 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 that if you're struggling even with obesity or if you're struggling with fear or if you're struggling with a, with a problem, you see, see, there might be people that are alcoholics, there might be people that are, that are druggies and junkies, but, but there are people who are addicted to food. God can break that, 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 that connection that you have. Oh, we must eat, but listen to me. I don't want to eat to live. Or I, I, I don't want to live to eat. I want to eat to live. And so that's just some of the things. Fear can be broken through the power of fasting and prayer. So, so Pastor, what's the purpose of fasting? It's a God-appointed way to humble ourselves before God. Listen, listen to your pastor today. Trust me, if you've never fasted before, if you fast, it will humble you. Yeah? When that Lord that's in the pit of your, and some, you know, right there, what do you call that? The stomach. It will, it, will, it will rise up against that. But I'm here to tell you that, that the Bible says this kind, when the demonic was, was not delivered by the disciples, he said this kind doesn't come out but by fasting and prayer. So I ask you, what this kind of a mountain do you have? What unsurmountable thing? What have you been diagnosed with? And, 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 and again, we're not against diagnoses. We're not against any of those things. I, 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 just, I just want to take you to a place maybe that some of you have never been into a realm that you would understand the, the, the full importance of, of fasting and prayer and how important that is. I'm here to tell you that, that, that fasting is a key. It is a key to more of you in 22. Andrew Murray said this, and I quote, here is the path to the higher life. Down, lower down. Just as the water always seeks and fills the lowest place, so the moment God finds men abased and empty, His glory and power flow to exalt Himself and to bless them. 
So how do we receive that when we're low? Not when we're filled with pride. Pride is one of the greatest tools of the enemy. And I'm here to tell you that, that pride will lead to destruction. God is not looking for a prideful people. God is looking for a people that will walk in humility. That God left heaven's splendor through his son, came to earth, bled and died on Calvary. He was in the grave. He arose the third day. He was, he was elevated to the lofty heights of grandeur. He's coming back for church without spot or wrinkle. I'm here to tell you that the key to you and I getting closer to God is the key I want to share with you today. Fasting. Fasting. And some of you are looking at me thinking you are crazy. Don't be careful that you don't call Jesus crazy. Because I'm quoting for him. I want you to look to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Hallelujah. So he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest you're more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may see you. Friend, go up higher, then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you for whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted pride is a factor that would say to us i can't do that i can't fast i can't pray I, i'm restricted and again i'm not a medical doctor maybe you are restricted but, but, but there are certain things. Listen, I don't know about you. Don't start off big. Maybe it's going without one meal. Just to draw closer to Him. When it says fasting, it's talking about food. It's not talking about fasting television. It's not about fasting this or that. It's talking about food. And God tells us, Jesus tells us to humble ourselves and find the lowest place. Pride and humility are dealt with here. See, pride will take us down. If I become a prideful pastor, if we become a prideful church, then, then beloved, that's not what God wants. It says, take the, take the lowest seat. Go, don't, don't, give, it, give the highest seat to someone else. Pride and humility are dealt with here. Don't, don't sit at the head seat. Take the lowest. If we humble ourselves, we'll be exalted. If we exalt ourselves, we'll be humiliated. Can I get a witness, church? Has God ever dealt in your life? He's dealt in my life with pride. Pride cometh before destruction. Humility versus pride. Humility is essential to effective prayer. To having more of you in 22. James chapter 4 verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, for He will lift you up. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6 says this, Likewise, you yourselves, likewise, your younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, of all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed in humility for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that you might, that he may be exalted, you may be exalted in due season. You see, it's not how high we can go, it's how low we can go. There, there's, there's a town, there's a city in the Bible it's called Lodabar. <laughs> low to bar. Well, God wants to bring us low. Because listen, I didn't save anybody. Oh, oh, you went out last week, you saved 14 people, and they all got filled with the Holy Spirit. You didn't save anybody. Because you and I cannot save anyone. He's the Savior, right? And He uses us, and He deals through people that are humble. I think of the patriarchs of old. I think of the, the Moody's. I think of others. And I think of the great revivalists. Those people walked in humility. They were clothed and bathed in humility. 
It was not, you know, give me the private jet, give me this big salary, what's the package, how much you giving me, uh, what, what's the incentive here? It, it can't be about that. It's got to be about Him. When God called me, He called me as a, a sophomore in high school, and, and He called me out of a life of degradation and sin, and He placed His hand upon me, and He said, I want you to be a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was eons ago. I came over on the Mayflower. It was in 1967 that I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And that call has been strong, and it's, it hasn't been as strong as it is right now on my heart and on my life. Therefore, humble yourself. Be submissive to the Lord under the mighty hand of God. You see, we don't come, we don't come to prayer as, as the Pharisees did and the Sadducees. The Pharisees, you see, the Pharisees were fair, you see, because they were the Pharisees. The Sadducees were sad, you see, because they were sad, you see. That's exactly. And the pharisaical people would have their phylacteries on the front of their head and they would stand on the street corners and they would pray these most flowery prayers and Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Beloved, it's not how high we go, it's how low we are. You see, I'm not too uppity as a pastor that if I, see, if I see something on the ground, I can't reach over and pick it up. If I go in the church, God convicts me. If I see something, of a, it's a piece of paper, I pick it up. You see, that's for the janitor. No, it isn't. That's pride. We're in this together. God, listen, when we come to God in prayer and fasting, we come in humility. We put on that cloak of humility, and God always honors that. Psalm 35, 13 but as for me, when, uh, when they, they were sick, my clothing, when I was sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting. We humble our, our, he said, we humble our souls in fasting. What is the soul? The soul is the intellect, the emotion, and the will. That's the soul. And so we come in humility. We don't come high and mighty. Humble our soul through fasting and prayer. Humbling ourselves before the Lord. Likewise. You younger people, submit. We come to that, the, the, the cross. We come to Jesus. We, we, we approach whether it's fasting or praying or whatever we do or singing or, or whatever we do for the glory and honor of God. We do it in a spirit of humility that he might receive the preeminence. Oh, people, God, are, God, is, God is stirring us and God is, and God is really beckoning us to have that heart's desire for more of you. Let's proceed a little further. And, and, I, and I want to ask you a question. First of all, humbling our soul through fasting is serving notice on our stomach. So I want to make this statement. Oh, he's not preaching now. He's meddling. <laughs> our stomach is either our servant or it's our master. Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, it was the day of atonement, verses 29 to 31. This shall be a statue forever to you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do not work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day, on that day, the day of atonement, on that day, the priests shall make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And it is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you. And you shall afflict your souls in a stature forever. What is that? When the Jewish people heard the word afflict, they knew that meant to fast. That knew, they knew that at that time they were to go without food. That's, that's what it means there. And, and, and Yom Kippur is, is the most sacred Jewish time of the Jewish people. It represents a time when the, when the priest would come and, and he, would, he would represent God and, 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 and he would come in his, his, his garb and he would enter into the most holy place. And you remember that the temple was divided and there was a curtain that divided and only priests could go in once a year to the most holy place to offer up an atonement for the Israelites' sin. 
But I got good news for you. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary and He gave it up for you and I. And His soul was afflicted and His body was beaten and He was maligned and ridiculed and they put Him in an empty tomb. But on the third day, He arose. And because Jesus lives, you and I live also. We have an abundance of life in Christ. And this was an incredible day. It was one of the highest holy days for the Jewish people. They, the word afflict, when the Jewish people heard that, I'll say it again, it meant go without food. So pastor, what is fasting anyway? You gave us this key that we could put on our refrigerator. You know, we're of the philosophy of those who indulge bulge. We just, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to go without anything. Challenge you, put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your refrigerator. What is fasting? What is fasting? Fasting is abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. I want to say that one more time. Very simple. What is fasting? Abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. Why? God, I want more of you in 22. God, I want this to be a key in my life. And you say, well, Pastor, I don't need this. I don't, need to, I don't need to have this tool in my life. I'm here to tell you that's why the church is so weak and anemic. Because we lack fasting and prayer. We are weak and, and anemic. I, I've, seen the, I've seen the back of flesh broken in my life because of fasting and prayer. I've seen God, you know, I, 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 I anointed parts of my body this morning that, that need healing. And I said, God, during this extended fast, I am believing you, whether it's a creative miracle or whatever it might be. I'm not against doctors and I'm not against anything of, of, of the medical field. I'm not, Lord, I'm not. But I am believing you for a divine touch on my body. It's not something that I have to earn. The Bible says, along with the atonement, it says, by your stripes, I am whole. Fear, leave in the name of Jesus. This, this virus brings tormenting fear to the body of Christ. And I say, to the, I say to, the, to, to, to the enemy on the authority of Jesus Christ, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Fear, leave God's people. Fear, go in the name of Jesus. Be replaced by His peace. Be replaced by His peace. Oh, listen. I fear. I do not fear man. And I don't fear anybody else. The, the person I fear is Jesus. I have reverential respect for Him. What's another way that, that we can implement this great, great key that will unlock the door to a reservoir of truth and freedom in our life? I've been praying very specifically during this fast for some things to be broken in my life that, I, that have held me down physically for not taking better care of myself. And this is just me. I'm not talking about I'm talking about me. Is it all right if I share that? I don't want it to be I, 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 me, 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 but I'm asking that those things be broken off my life. That I believe God gave me a prophecy when I was down and out, and he said the latter years of your life are going to be greater than the former, and I have a responsibility to take care of myself. This is God's temple. I know you're not going to get a lot of amens about this. If I was preaching about prosperity, maybe some of you would say, hey! But when we're talking about fasting, you're saying, Oh! Not that again. We get that every, every first of the year. Yeah, we know. Yeah. I want you to look at Ezra. Ezra chapter 8, verses 21 through 23. What a tremendous miracle. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Haheva that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from Him the right way for us and our little ones, and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road. Because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we... What do we do? We, we, we wrung our fingers. 
And we and we were just in we were just in fear and and we were just we were just like we're we're chopping off our nails to the to the bone. No, it says we fasted and we entreated our God. If that's good for then, it's good for now. It said we fasted and we entreated our God. Oh God, I entreat you. I entreat you, Lord. And he answered our prayer. I'm going to make a bold statement for you, and some of you are going to think that, that I'm absolutely maybe off course here, but it's not true. There are some things. I believe in prayer. I believe God answers prayer, but there are some things that prayer alone, unless it's coupled with fasting, you'll never see the deliverance in your life. You'll never see that deliverance in your life. You never will. That's why the enemy has blinded the eyes of the church. We got too many pastors behind pulpits just waiting for their salary and their check, and they're worried if they're going to lose people. It's all about nickels and noses. I love you all, but I am telling you this is one of the best kept secrets to the body of Christ for deliverance and freedom that we have not used properly. Hallelujah. And that's why we don't have revival. I'm going to tell you what, you'll never meet a revivalist. You'll never meet a Finney. You'll never, uh, a D.L. Moody or a Smith Wigglesworth. You'll never, you'll never meet any one of them. Those men and the women, they fasted and they prayed. Do you know that before their revival meetings, they sent people before them to fast and pray? One particular time, this, this young boy, I forget his name, he got under the grandstands before one of, of the Finneys or West, one of them went to preach this great revival and he was underneath the grandstands. What was he doing? He was fasting and praying. He was on his face before God, crying out to that city before the evangelists ever stepped foot on that property. You know what Westfield needs? It, it doesn't need another new mayor. It doesn't need this and that. What this city needs is Revival. What this city needs is men and women be birthed into the kingdom of God. It, it, it needs to see people that are bound set free in Jesus' name. And I know that there are, there are folk outside and there are folk inside the church that are bound that God wants to set free. Set free. Listen to this. Ezra obtained safe conduct by God's power. What did you do, Pastor? Ezra did something that you and I sometimes do. By testifying to the king, listen to this, he put himself in a position where he had to live up to his own testimony. That's what he did. He positioned himself, Ezra, that he had to live up to his own testimony. What do you believe? Do you believe the authenticity of this word? Do you believe everything in this word is true? Amen. Hallelujah. Ezra stood Paul, in the midst of adversity. And listen, he had to live up to his own testimony. I, I want to say something to you, and I want to preach to myself today. You and I in this world need to live up to our testimony. What is our testimony? Look what the Lord has done. Yeah, he healed my body. He saved my soul. We have a testimony. The Bible says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they weren't afraid to die. I'm not afraid to die. I could have died in that hospital and, 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 and I would have just, I would just want to got ahead of you all to be able to be with Jesus. But he said, no, I'm not finished with you yet. And he's not finished with you yet. You're not a loser. You're a winner. I'm here to tell you. I'm not here to beat you up. I'm here to lift you up in the name of Jesus and, and let you be introduced to a key that will revolutionize your life if you put it into practice. It will set you free. It will set you free. I'm here to tell you, it will set you free. It will. You say you shouldn't get that excited. Well, if I can get excited about other things, I can get excited about Jesus. So by testifying, he lived up to his testimony. He had told the king, we are the servants of the living God. Let's not ever forget that. You and I are servants of the living God. You and I are servants of the living God. We belong to Jesus. Hallelujah. The king lives within our heart. Oh, we might not be perfect. We might fall sometimes. But I'm telling you, when you fall, get back up. When you fall and just sin, repent of that sin and get back up. Because as his arms open wide for us. So he says, our God protects us and supplies all of our need. And God opened up a way for Ezra 
by his testimony to put into practice by leading a, a company of returning exiles, Jewish people, back to Jerusalem. It was a long and it was a dangerous journey through the savage tribes and bandits along the way. But how, how would God protect them from Babylon to Jerusalem? Ezra chose not to get an escort of soldiers and horsemen and the mighty men of the king that day. But he relied on the supernatural power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you we serve a supernatural God. You're wondering where are the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit in the church? Well, when we start fasting and praying, we're going to see them released in the name of Jesus. You know why? Because we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna die to the flesh. And we're going to say, God, I want to serve you. Whatever it takes in my life. Whatever it, what is it in your life? Don't tell me. Please don't say it out loud. What is the mountain that seems to keep plaguing you every time God wants to get a hold of you? And all you want to do is boogie. All you want to do is get your sneakers on, your Nikes, and run out. Try to, good luck! You're never going to outrun God. Run to the roar. Don't run away from it. You see, I can't do that. You can do all things through Christ. It's pride that's keeping you from Jesus. Well, I'm sure people are going to get excited about that. It's pride. What are people going to think? What are people going to think? What are they going to do? A supernatural protection and power. Ezra, Ezra proclaimed. What did he do? He didn't, he didn't proclaim, let's have a get together and eat food. Okay, he said this. He said, I'm going to proclaim a fast. And the reason that we might afflict our souls, there it again, go without food before our God. So we fasted and besought our God for us. And he entreated us. Whew. Oh, I feel like jumping over this pulpit, but I would hurt myself bad. <laughs> What were the results, Pastor? The returning band of Jewish exiles completed their long journey of four months. And they completed it. And they were safe. And they didn't even have all the horsemen with all of their might leading them. What did they do? They realized the key of more of you. In 22. More of you in 22. Something's different this year. I just got to say it. Something's different during this fast for me. Something is like I've never experienced before. God is going to break some things in my life and here at New Life that need to be broken so that He can fix it. In your life, what is it? What is it that you're experiencing that plagues you and labors you and keeps you down? There's a key that very few Christians ever practice in their life. And that's why we stay bound. I want to go on and just share a couple more illustrations, then I'll be done. Turn to Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. Hallelujah. First of all, I want to back up and share a little bit in Esther chapter 3. We see Haman's conspiracy against the Jews. He was advanced in King Ahasuerus, who was the king then in his service. He was advanced. And all of the servants of the king, they had to bow down to this wicked man. And Haman set out to destroy the Jews. Can I say something to you? We know who's out to destroy the church and out to destroy you and I. Who is it? Satan. It's a devil. It's a devil. It's the enemy. He wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy me. He wants to destroy this church and any church in this community that preaches the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it's time to draw a line in the sand. And find out what side you're on. Be all in. Be all in. And in Esther chapter 4, Esther transforms disaster into triumph. And Esther 4 describes the greatest crisis facing the Jewish people. The greatest crisis. The name of the man 
who was used by Satan, and Satan's advocate is, 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 is Haman, and, and he's against the Jewish people, and, and the decree went out to destroy Israel, and this story has, has given rise to, to the feast that the Jewish uh, people uh, celebrate, Purim, which means lots. This, fast, th this feast is so called because Haman cast lots to, de to, to determine the day that, that the Israelites, the Jewish nation, was going to be destroyed. Casting lots, you know what that was a form of? Of divination. Divination. Listen to me. Listen to your pastor. If you have anything in your house that resembles the dom demonic, you need to get it out. Oh, it's okay to have a Ouija board. Are you crazy? I'm sorry. Forgive me. Are you nuts? Anything. <laughs> anything that would inhibit us. We need to get rid of those things. Anything that would resemble that. And I don't want to go into naming a, a, a lot of things because uh, I don't have that time. But casting lots was a form of divination that Haman was doing. What was he doing? He was seeking guidance from the occult practices. And this was a conflict. This was a, a conflict. It was a battle on the spiritual realm. You and I are not fighting a battle on the natural realm. You and I are fighting a battle on the spiritual realm. And the only way we need to fight it is spiritually. Not in the flesh. And fasting will kill your flesh quicker than anything. It won't like it at first. It won't. It won't. You know why? Because it's, got, it's gotten his way. All these years. This was a conflict on the spiritual plane. It wasn't just flesh against flesh, but spirit against spirit. Through Haman, Satan was actually challenging, listen to this, the power of God. He was challenging the power of God. We have people today that are trying to challenge the power of God. Not me. I want that power of God operating in my life. I want it operating in my marriage. I want it operating in my home. I want it operating in this church. Hallelujah. And there's, there, there, there's several keys. But there's a key that is so very powerful. And so what happened? They, they called a, a, a fast. A fast. In Esther 4, 15 and, and verse 16, they, they called a fast and said, go, go to the place of Shushan and, and, and I, want you to, I want you to get all these people, Mordecai, together, all the Jewish people. And, 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 and Queen Esther, she's going to go before the king. But we need to be fasting and praying that the destruction of, of the Jewish people will not come about our people. So, so they, 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 they fasted and they prayed. Why? So that Esther would go into the king. To go into the king unannounced would be not only impending danger, it would be death. But she was doing it because there was this individual used by the enemy, by the name of Haman, that wanted to destroy and annihilate the Israelites. Sound familiar? Hitler? Huh? Huh? I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. We need as a nation, our president and any president, and leadership of government needs to have enough common sense that we need to be under the blessing and not under the curse. We need to bless that Jewish nation and the Jewish people. And it was agreed upon. And they agreed to fast for three days, night and day, neither eating and drinking. This was an extreme fast. Listen, I, I would not recommend going into fasting without drinking. Your body can go without food, but it only can go without water for so long. This was extreme. God spoke to their heart to do it. And not just one, they didn't say, I can't do that. Every one of them were required to save and salvage the Jewish nation. And then Esther told them to reply, to, to call upon the Lord and again in the hour of crisis, God came through, and we find God's people gathered together. They fasted 72, 72 hours without eating and drinking. And the outcome of that whole policy of the Persian Empire was completely changed. And, and what was impending danger and annihilation for the Jewish people was salvaged and saved. How? Through fasting. I'm here to tell you, if your marriage is on the brink of disaster, fast and pray. 
If you need healing in your body and deliverance in your body, hallelujah, if it seems like the flesh is taking over more than the spirit, fast and pray. Oh, I know this is a bold message to preach today, but it's a message that I must preach because I am passionate about that. And listen to this. Mordecai and Esther became the two most influential, prominent personalities in the Persian politics. What got them there? Fasting and prayer. I want you to turn, and we're going to give a New Testament analysis, and then we'll close. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Hallelujah. Thank God for His Word. We then as workers together with Him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is this accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Put the other one up before I even read the next one. Some of you have bought into the lie that either you're not good enough or you've failed too much or your past will not be relinquished and you just seem to feel like, well, you know, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until I'm ready. I'm going to clean up my life. Why do you think God sent his son? I can't clean up my life. Only he can clean up my life. Only he can clean, no pastor can clean up your life. You can't clean up my life. Jesus can clean our life up. Amen. I tell you what, he'll get you squeaky, he'll, give you, he'll get you squeaky cleaner than the bald-headed guy that has that white uniform on the commercials. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will do that. He will do that. He will set you free. So I'm here to tell you, today is your day. God knew you were going to be here before the foundation of the world. Today is your day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give no offense to anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience. Oh, I have a little problem with that. I know, I'm sure nobody else does. In tribulations, in diseases, in distresses, in stripes, oh hallelujah, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, and here we go, in fasting. It's there. It's in the Word of God. It's in the Word of God right there. That's what Paul's saying. See, as a minister of the gospel, I wouldn't be worth my salt if I didn't believe and practice this practice of fasting. Because there are times when I'm in my office and I can only put my hand up to Jehovah God and say, this is too much for me. God, I cannot do this in my ingenuity. I cannot do this in almost 50 years of ministry. I can just, cannot do this in the claims of man or because I have a, a BA degree or, or because, I, because I'm a pastor and have REV before my name. I cannot do this in myself. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. What draws you to this church is not Pastor Wayne. I'm not an eloquent preacher. What draws you to this church is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's who he is. He's not an it. You didn't get it. You got him. Hallelujah. It says hunger. See, the key, Paul fasted often. He fasted often. Hunger and thirst is when you have nothing to eat and drink. But fasting is when you have the refrigerator full and you have everything to eat and drink, but you choose not to. That's the difference. And again, I'm not from some Pharisee. I'm not legislating this. It, you know, we're going to learn later in the Scripture, and I'm going to quit in a minute, is that it's up to the leadership to call a solemn fast and prayer. Because that breaks, that breaks the back of the enemy. Hunger and thirst is, is, is just something that, we, that we, 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 we might have all that stuff, but we want to go without it because we want to draw closer to him. And personally, and i got to do this very quickly, fasting for the last 25 to 30 years, what it's done in my life, I can't even begin. But God said, this, son, this fast is going to be different for you. I'm going to take you to places that you've never known. And I'm not talking geographically. 
I have no inclination of resigning the church. But I'm going to take you. you. I gave you. I gave you that prayer, son. More of me in 22. So you've asked me. I'm going to give you more of me. I don't need more of the assemblies of God. I don't need more of, 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 of uh, uh, congregationalism. I don't need more of, of Baptist. I don't need more of Pentecostal. I don't, I don't need more of Lutheran. I need more of Jesus. That's what I need. That's what I need. And there have been extended fasts that through that, God led Gail and I on an extended fast to, to come here to the Pioneer Valley 17 years ago. We knew that God had finished our ministry there in Maine. He said, I'm going to call you to a place. And I want to bless you and I want to use you. And, and I just want to say to you people, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your love. I thank you. We're not a perfect church. If you find one, let me know. But I'm here to tell you that we're, we're a loving bunch. And I want to thank you for your prayers. And I pray for you. And I preach this message because I feel the Holy Spirit saying there's a mission, missing ingredient in our lives that we're not paying attention to in the Word of God. Then I want us to look to corporate fasting. That's personal fasting. Acts 13, 1 through 4. I'm not going to take the time to read it, and it's there for you. But there were five apostles, five men that were set aside apart for God. And what happened to these five men? They were ready to send out Saul and Barnabas. They were ready to send them out but before they sent them out, what did they do? They fasted and they prayed. Before, listen, what would happen if this church, you and I, and every one of us, before we ever made a major decision, we would fast and pray? I'm going to get out of the bank, get a loan for that car. Nothing wrong with that. But it might be good to consult the Lord first. He might get you a better deal. Or he might do something different in your life. See, the key here was, was fasting and prayer. And, and it's so implicit here. They, 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 they heard from God. They heard God's strategy. One of the greatest ways to hear from God is, is using this key. One of the greatest ways to hear from God. I never, listen, I'm here to tell you this. I never hear as clear from God as I do when I'm in a fast. I never feel His presence like I do when I'm in a fast coupled with prayer. Never. It's those times that God has called me. It's those times that he said things that I, I was incapable of and he did it miraculously. Miraculously. So what's the key here? The key here is how can we hear from God as a church before we do anything? The Bible says they fasted. They fasted first to find God's will and then they fasted before they sent them out. They did it first. Have you ever done things in the rear backwards? Me. You, you do something, then you ask God to bless it. Isn't, it. isn't it much better to be a part of what God's blessing? Oh, God, I just thought I'd make that decision. Would you bless it? And he, he is merciful. He will at times. But it's best to seek him first. Amen. I know you're hanging, and some of you are, are, are you know, you're, you're, just, you're just ready to go. But I want to close with this. Two conclusions to this message. And I want to, I want to quote a scripture. I want to share a scripture that's very powerful. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, and you know it. If my, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. See, I want to I just talk for a few moments on something that is entitled hope for a nation. And let's break it down. Not only hope for a nation, but hope for the city of Westfield. Hope for our families. Hope for our marriages. Hope for our relationships. But this is hope for a nation. And I, wa I want you to look at this. That there, are, there are seven steps here. Four steps are required of us. What are we to do? We are first to humble ourselves. One of the greatest ways to humble yourself is, is, to, is to... How many like to go on vacation? Are you with me? Come on, don't be weird. You like to go on vacation. Well, when's the last time you put your stomach on vacation? That might sound hilarious. But do you know, health-wise, our stomach needs to go on vacation from time to time? Healthy-wise and spiritually-wise. 
But it doesn't like to go on vacation. It doesn't. It doesn't. So we humble ourselves. Then we pray. This is, this is on us. And he says, then seek my face. And then he says, turn from your wicked ways. Listen, when you fast and pray, sin will ex be exposed in your life. It will be, it'll be exposed in my life. And it will be exposed in this church. Then the Holy Spirit can deal with it. Amen? Then the last three are the requirements of God. When you do these four, I will do the three. Then, then, then you will hear from heaven and I will forgive your sin and I will hear your land. And then the second conclusion to this message is found in Joel chapter 2, verse 15 and Joel 28. And I'll close with this. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass. Here's the key. I want you to listen to this. I want you to say it with me. It shall come to pass afterwards. Say afterwards with me. Afterwards. That was weak. Afterwards. afterwards. After what? Afterwards. Then it will happen. It will happen. Shh. Please. Please. Yes. Thank you. We don't need that. Hallelujah. Then. Then, afterwards, then I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And also on your maidens, uh, I will pour out my spirit on your, your, your men servants and your man servants. And I will pour out your, my spirit upon your flesh. I will pour it on all flesh. Stand with me, would you? How many of you got your key? Got your key? Hold it up to the Lord. This is a key. This is a key. Not, not all the keys. This is a key to having more of you in 22. It's a vital key. It's a vital key. I want to pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. Father, I want to thank you for the strength, for the power, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, your Holy Spirit. Father, I love you. I love you. I love you, Father. Can we just worship the Lord for a few moments? I love you, Jesus. I want to tell you what happened this week. I don't know if it was Wednesday or Thursday, but we were in the prayer room, and before we even started praying, we started worshiping the Lord. The power of God, prayer and worship is a part. It, it, it's a part it, worship is a part of prayer. And as we begin to pray and worship the Lord, the Spirit of God filled that room. We began to pray for people that were sick and afflicted, people's memories to be touched. You have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. And I'm not asking you to bow your heads. I'm asking you to open your eyes and look right at me. Is there anyone here this morning? That you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. You struggle with certain things in your life, addictions that you've tried to break in yourself. New Year's resolution after New Year's resolution, and you couldn't break them because they have a strong grip on your life. Well, let me introduce you, reintroduce you to a key called fasting, coupled with prayer. The demonic could not be delivered from the little boy. And the disciples were appalled about it. And they were, they've seen people heal. They were upset. Jesus, why? And Jesus said, this kind. It doesn't happen but through fasting and prayer. You know, my, my prayers during this fast that if I want more of him, it's got to be less of me. I don't want to be in the way. If I, if I was in the way of this church, I would leave tomorrow. If I was in the way of the progress of this church, I would leave today. But I know I'm not. Because we're all traveling on this journey. And I'm talking about a tool today that will break the back of the enemy in your life. Your flesh isn't going to like it. It isn't. Is there anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as your personal Savior? Just slip your hand up and we'll pray for you. We'll pray for you if you don't know Jesus. 
Is there anybody here that has some certain things in your life and issues in your life that seem to have followed you for, for a long time and you just want to be set free from them today? Can I just see your hand? Wow, wow, you are a free bunch. 15, 16 of our people are free. Hallelujah. That's good. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to dismiss you. And then we're going to, I know I got a board meeting. Uh, they're going to have something back there for refreshments for the board, for the board, not for anybody else. But I'm just going to stay here for a while before we start that board meeting because I want more of him. So I'll release you because I'm respective of your time. But if you want to stay and just come around these altars, we're going to put some music on them. We're going to praise and worship the Lord. So I just want to pray a closing prayer. Father, I want to thank you for your people, Lord. They've been so kind and attentive today. I know some might say, well, I didn't have a choice, but Father, I thank you for that, Lord. And God, I did not say this is the only key. It's one of the keys that will unlock the treasure chest of God so that we could have more of you in 22. And God, I pray that you would speak to every individual heart. Lord, I know specifically I have things that you're going to break in me that I've been holding on to. They're going to be broken. I know they are, Father, because you told me so. So, Father, I just love you today. I thank you for your people. Go with them. Be with them. Give them safe journeys, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.